resilient and self-reliant India. Today's session is in the form of a conversation with India's dynamic external affairs minister, Dr. Subramanyam Jayashankar. Conducting this conversation is Fiki's incoming president, Mr. Uday Shankar, who is also president of the Walt Disney Company Asia Pacific and chairman Star and Disney India. As a trendsetter in the media and entertainment industry for over two decades, Mr. Uday Shankar is a leading voice in the Indian media and broadcasting sector, shaping reforms for the industry and its consumers. I now invite Mr. Uday Shankar, President-elect Fiki, for his opening remarks. Thank you, Sushma, and a very warm welcome to our special guest and Minister for External Affairs, Dr. Jay Shankar, and also to this distinguished audience that's watching us from all over the world. It's a privilege to have this conversation with Dr. Jashankar. I have always been an admirer of yourself. You're a distinguished diplomat and an intellectual and a tireless advocate for creating alignment between Indian perspective and the global good. In your varied roles as a career diplomat of Foreign Secretary and the External Affairs Minister, Dr. Jashankar has been at the helm of an exciting transformation of India's global interface. Dr. Jashankar has received the Padma Shri in 2019 and has recently published a book called The India Way, The Strategies for an Uncertain World. The book has received enormous critical acclaim. Thank you for agreeing for this conversation, Dr. Jashankar. The theme of the current annual convention, Inspired India, is a response to the world scenario. During the pandemic, <clears throat> like the rest of the world, India has been forced to innovate, build new skills, and strengths and work with renewed focus on health and humanity. Inspiration is the key to fulfilling those goals. Today, we are in the midst of a global health challenge that has forced to rethink on all these aspects. Here, I would like to invoke the words of the great Tiruvalluvar, whom you quote at the beginning of your book, sir. Wisdom is to live in tune with the mode of the changing world. And on that note, shall we start the conversation, Minister? Please, it's a pleasure. Uh, let me also say a few uh, opening words. I mean, first of all, it's really a great pleasure uh, today to address uh, the 93rd Annual Convention. Uh, and I think you, with Inspired India, you've sort of just struck the right uh, note. And it's a, I think it's something I value, these opportunities, because one, uh, when you, uh, when you uh, are in charge of foreign policy, uh, business is a very important element of that. Uh, it is not just an expression of our national capabilities uh, and, a, and a really a, a, a sort of the driver of job creation in India. It is also a very important instrument really to uh, shape the world, to exercise influence, to generate outcomes in our favor. So in a way, I mean, uh, you may not explicitly think of it that way, but you are one of my partners in, in my, my business, uh, if it were. Secondly, there is a similarity in the nature of our business, you know, because uh, a lot of it for both of us is about negotiation. And I think in good negotiations and smart negotiations, you want everybody to come out ahead. You know, uh, a really smart negotiation is one where there are not winners and losers. So I, I sort of take a lot of inspiration from business uh, practices and business thinking uh, as, I, as I practice my uh, own profession. Uh, and uh, it's, a, uh, you know, again, it's a great pleasure to uh, be with you. Uh, and I hope we have a very good conversation. I'm sure we will have a great conversation. And thank you for that spirit of partnership, Minister. Once again, you're very gracious. Now, let's on the conversation, sir, let's just start with something that, that is recent. And while it is a normal occurrence in any democracy, it has evoked a lot of uh, interest and intrigue given the nature and times that it has taken place. I'm talking about the US elections. What would be your view on the outcome of the US election? There are a lot of speculation, and not necessarily all of them are very informed ones. But it's clearly that the it's clear that the relationship between India, U, India and US is very important. And do you see significant changes or new developments in the light of the new administration that's set to take the office there? American elections, you know, are really quite unique. 
maybe it is because what happens in America has an impact on all of us. Uh, so, and if it has an impact, and obviously we'd like to know, you know, what is it which is going to uh, impact me. But I would say that, you know, probably other than cricket, I can't think of any other subject where so many Indians have, you know, I've never met a person who doesn't have a view on the American elections. Uh, so uh, the uh, the point I would though make before we come to how it impacts us, I think it's important to understand what are the debates in America. Because it's only when we understand, follow and understand those debates, will we understand what does it mean for us? Now, what is really the number one uh, issue uh, in America? I think no question the economy. Uh, to, when it comes to foreign policy, uh, I think China is a big issue. Russia is a big issue. Uh, the situation in the Middle East uh, has traditionally been an issue. It continues to be so. But I would still come back to the economy because we are seeing, you know, uh, sort of uh, debates and arguments in America, which are quite different for America. You know, one of the interesting debates is whether actually this America at this time should actually have an industrial policy. Now, for most Indians, you'd be baffled by it because we've always had an industrial policy. But that's not been the American tradition. You know, the, the free enterprise system uh, in, in America is actually quite allergic to the idea of an industrial uh, policy. So uh, I, I think today, you know, what should be the relationship between uh, state and market and markets and livelihood? I mean, these, these are big issues in America. I think the other is uh, technology. I think, you know, again, uh, the role of big tech. Uh, you know, I mean, there is a there is an international debate about it, but there's a very vigorous American debate about it. That you know, uh, uh, has big how big should big tech be allowed to become, uh, and what is the influence? What are the ripples uh, of that? So I, you know, if I were to sum up my takeaway from the uh, Biden, uh, you know, a Biden administration coming into office. I would say vis-a-vis -vis the world, uh, you know, quite apart from the security issues and the political influence issues, all those. One big question I think for them is uh, how do they make keep America competitive? And the other big question is really how do they, uh, you know, deal with the climate change uh, challenge, which many of them have very uh, passionate uh, beliefs in. The difference we would make now is where would we stand vis-a-vis -vis American priorities? You know, it's, it would be natural for the United States to look at the world and evaluate countries. I don't think, I wouldn't regard this as transactionalism. I, I think it would be, a, to me, a common uh, diligence which you would do uh, as you approach international relations. You know, where does this country or these sets of players fit into my game plan? And my sense is today, uh, that on key key aspects of the relationship, certainly when it comes to uh, security and uh, uh, defense, when it comes to economic issues, especially competitiveness, uh, I think India can make a very big difference. And most of all, I think, and India, because we have act we are actually doing today much more on global issues and global challenges than we have done before. Uh, even on something like climate change, if you look, our, our policy under this government has been very, very much more, uh, you know, yeah. uh, uh, enthusiastic and contributive uh, than than in the past. Today, the relationship is in such a different level that the only place for it to go, in my view, is up. That's very encouraging, and that's what I'm sure most Indians would have liked to hear. But on that note, sir, if if, if I was to just take it a little bit forward. We have often heard that there is a trade deal in the works. And, uh, you know, we've heard from sources in government also on both sides. And do you think that process gets accelerated or some, you know, we, we, we should hope to see some outcome sooner than later? Well, uh, there was a fairly serious negotiation uh, between our government uh, and the Trump administration 
on resolving uh, the outstanding trade issues. Okay. I think the uh, general thinking on both sides was, uh, let's deal with the differences before we think of something bigger. Now, there was a lot of toing and froing about it, a lot of discussions, a lot of people spent a lot of time uh, on it. Uh, for a variety of reasons, they didn't close it out. Okay, I can tell you on our side, we were dead serious. Uh, we wanted we wanted to deal with those issues because we thought there was something much bigger that was in store uh, for the relationship. Uh, but it didn't happen. And often when it comes to, you know, these trade discussions, very frankly, trade discussions are like business discussions between two governments. Uh, and, you know, in business, I think you and all our listeners know, I mean, it's never done till it's done. Uh, the devil is in the detail. If, you know, if you don't close out the deal, it's not a deal. Uh, so you may, a deal you come close by is still a deal you didn't get done. So uh, I do uh, realize that, you know, we, we made a very uh, focused, serious, uh, persevering effort. Uh, it, it didn't get done uh, this year. I do believe that in a very, very basic way, the United States is a complementary economy. Uh, that if you look at the uh, at the products uh, of the United States, the exports of the United States, there, there isn't a fundamental uh, sort of uh, clash of interests out here. There are a lot of areas where we do what we do and they do what they do. There are areas of overlap, I, I think, uh, particularly on the digital side, uh, I'm sure there will be vigorous uh, discussions, but uh, I, I do think at the end of the day, the United States is a complementary economy. And I think as a, you know, FTAs are also, uh, they're not just trade deals. I mean, you, you, even, even trade deals are not just trade deals. You. Uh, you know, you right. do think of it in a somewhat strategic way. Uh, you should think of it in a somewhat strategic way. And I uh, certainly hope that we have uh, very serious uh, uh, discussions uh, once the administration comes in. And I know our minister is, you know, he's very focused on it. And it's, it's something which is rightly very important in his agenda. Thank you. So, you know, minister, the framework of this conversation actually has been borrowed from something that you've said in your book, that this is a time to engage America, manage China, cultivate Europe, reassure Russia, and bring Japan into play. Moving from the Indo-US relationship, comprehensively, if we come to our border situation, that remains a matter of concern. Now, I just wanted your point of view. You've been very uh, forthright on what the, the realities are. And once again, I just wanted to hear from you uh, whether things are moving in the right direction and uh, should we be prepared for this to be a long haul or sh should there be a breakthrough sooner? You know, we were discussing uh, business and trade and I said, nothing is done till it's done. I think it is even harder to predict when it comes to national security uh, issues. So I won't get into the prediction zone at all, whether you know it's going to be easy or not and you know what will be the timelines and so on. But I would make two or three points here. One, uh, that I think the events of this year have been very disturbing. They have raised some very basic concerns because uh, they have happened because the other party has not abided by, by uh, uh, agreements that we have had with them uh, about respecting and observing the line of actual control and not bringing forces uh, uh, to the, uh, to the uh, line of actual control. So in a sense, I would say it's like in your world, you'll be dealing with somebody who has violated the terms of a contract. I mean, clearly you, you can understand uh, and in a very substantial way. Now, uh, I also believe that, uh, you know, what has happened is not actually in the interest of China because what it has done is uh, it has uh, significantly impacted public sentiment. Uh, uh, you know, I have seen the evolution, uh, I mean, professionally, I've seen the evolution of, uh, you know, how the Indian public feels about China over the last 
uh, many decades. Uh, and I am old enough to remember, you know, much more uh, difficult days, uh, I mean, especially in my childhood and my teens. So I think a lot of work had gone into the relationship on both sides. Uh, and I don't believe that the events of this year uh, have uh, helped, uh, you know, uh, at all. I mean, in fact, I, I think uh, uh, the real danger is that uh, the goodwill, uh, which was so so uh, carefully, uh, you know, developed, uh, will will dissipate. Uh, the uh, uh, but I also would say that yes, we are being tested. I have every confidence that we will rise to the occasion. We will meet that national security challenge. But beyond that, at this time, I would really, frankly, keep my own counsel. Thank you. That's very candid. Uh, coming to the next question, Minister, there is this whole new trend of using technology as a, as a, as a tool in bilateral negotiation. And it, it's almost, we are almost seeing a phase of techno-nationalism. You know, and it's becoming a uh, more and more active factor in international and bilateral relationship that could fundamentally order ge alter geopolitics. For a country like India, which has a great deal of strength in technology and, you know, and can also use technology for bilateral uh, commercial and business advantages, but can also be a very significant victim in this whole power play. Do you think that could have a that could be a matter of concern in our ambitions to grow to a five trillion economy and and bring benefits to our society at large well you know i'd really be a little careful with that term techno nationalism because somewhere maybe i'm being oversensitive but somehow it sort of doesn't give you a good feeling okay it sort of makes out as though you know somewhere you're doing something wrong by being techno nationalistic uh, and I would put it differently. I, I think uh, today, uh, as the power of the digital is being increasingly appreciated, uh, uh, it is natural that across the world, there will be many more countries and societies and people who would want to have some influence over their own digital future. Now, uh, what, you know, when you, use the word techno-nationalism, and maybe that's not your intention. What it does is it somehow implies as though uh, transnational players have some kind of uh, natural legitimacy. Uh, and, you know, one should not uh, somewhere uh, sort of, uh, we should accept their influence and their dominance in a very uh, unquestioning way. Now, my sense is you are seeing a lot of that today happen in the digital domain just like you saw in the industrial domain, which is we are playing digital catch-up. Now, if there's one country, one society which should be doing it, it's us. Because, you know, it, it should not be our fate that like in the past, we ended up as a market for other industrial economies. Today, we end up as the generator of data and the consumer of data with no uh, benefits uh, uh, for our enterprises and our talents. Uh, so uh, I would say uh, today it's it's uh, very important uh, that we uh, we actually uh, generate that uh, greater awareness uh, about the enormous potential which the digital world holds. Uh, you know the potential of of really delivering uh, on on uh, so many of the essential requirements of life, of actually. Uh, creating a value of of uh, actually creating employment uh, of uh, encouraging innovation uh, so uh, i think you know uh, for me one of the very encouraging sets of you know policies which have come out in the last 6 years have been in that digital india innovate startup you know that that zone but i would also say this that the world itself will be a knowledge economy in a very fundamental way. You know, that if you look pretty much at any product, any sophisticated product you use, uh, any service uh, that you avail of, uh, it is increasingly knowledge driven. And knowledge means talent. So yeah. 
I would develop our talent not only, you know, because it will make me a stronger nation. I would actually develop our talent because I see ourselves as an HR superpower. That uh, I think an India which actually deploys its talent globally. Uh, and, and the American relationship is the prime example of this. You know, that it is actually a talent connect, uh, which has been the game changer with America. And I think that talent connect today has a much uh, broader possibility. Uh, you know, I hear, I see a lot of interest expressed in it in Europe. Uh, I think there are uh, societies, economies, which in the past, you know, were, were more uh, conservative uh, in this regard, but today are, are opening up. I think some of it is also related to global demographic trends, uh, but some of it is, you know, at the end of the day, uh, the, the, I would say the engineering capability of India, the innovation capability of India, the medical capability of India. I think these are today increasingly of interest uh, to the world. Clearly you're thinking very, very deeply about these issues. And uh, that I guess that is why you set up new and emerging strategic technologies division in your own ministry sir, for the first time. We would just like to know as a matter of interest, what is the thinking behind that? I think the thinking behind that was very basic, which is an appreciation of the growing role of technology uh, in foreign policy and diplomacy. And I sort of give you an example, say one geography where we have a very tech sort of centric reputation is Africa. Okay. There's a lot of interest in Africa and working with us in the digital domain. Now, what we have done is we have actually started a set of uh, telemedicine uh, and teleeducation uh, 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 sort of projects. So uh, we, you know, in, in many cases, uh, we have seen our own uh, companies there, you know, we, we do run centers of excellence for training uh, uh, in in the digital domain in in Africa, and what happens is when people become familiar with that, they're also open to to initiatives and governance uh, uh, practices. Uh, a few weeks ago, in fact, I was talking to the foreign minister of Philippines, and he was enormously interested in actually uh, e-education. Uh, uh, so, so I you know, it it fits with the world's image of India. Okay, uh, this in their eyes is, this is our branding. Okay. Yes. We need to leverage that branding and make it into a bigger than national business. We need to go out there, you know, for me, if, if you know, we are into education, health, tax, uh, you know, uh, social uh, security delivery, I would, it can't be bigger than that for me as, as the foreign minister. I mean, uh, that, that then gives me a degree of goodwill and uh, uh, sort of empathy, uh, which no amount of traditional diplomacy would do. So, so uh, a lot of our uh, NEST ideas, I mean, the NEST itself was more to evaluate uh, and uh, sort of, uh, shall I say, alert. Uh, but it, it obviously impacts the thinking of the rest of the ministry as well. Right. Now, coming to you know a, a supplementary question around that, which could be of interest to our own constituency at FIKI. How can the the how can FIKI and our members work more closely? Because clearly there is a business angle to it. You're talking about NEST and you're talking about other countries where brand India has a certain business potential. How do, how can we work more closely to leverage that potential? You know, to some extent we are doing. Uh, so, so I want people to be aware of that. Uh, that you know, uh, I mean, you. I think you and I ourselves have we have done a number of events uh, uh, this year. Uh, I've done many with Sangeeta as well. Uh, but uh, where it is helpful uh, is that uh, one we have a very big development partnership. Uh, initiative, which is, you know, it, it helps to build connectivity, uh, to build the basis for economic cooperation, 
Uh, a lot of it is centered around South Asia, our immediate neighbors, but it extends to Africa. It extends to, uh, you know, we are trying now to take it into Central Asia in a big way. So the whole idea, you know, where it makes a difference is if the Indian, you know, if Business India, if FICI and MEA partner together, and we, you know, we, we support each other, I mean, your successors rebound to our national credit, okay? Our national credibility makes, opens up doors and provides avenue uh, for, for your business. And that is important because your business, every contract you get abroad means that many more jobs for me at home. And one of the changes I would like to see, you know, in our own system, in my own ministry, is that's the kind of thinking I would like to see. That at the end of the day, you know, for me, the success of foreign policy has got to be in national development, has got to be in, in how it shows up in terms of uh, job numbers and employment creation uh, at home. And here, I think this works very well. And uh, my sense is, I, again, as someone who's been around a, a fair length of time, uh, I, I would say, the, you know, uh, uh, suddenly today uh, we work much more closely and comfortably with you and, you know, your members uh, than we've ever done before. I think today any Indian business which goes into any embassy, I mean, we don't even have to tell our ambassadors, you know, uh, they know, I mean, if somebody uh, comes that, you know, it's, it's, they consider it a very natural part of their representation, representing India abroad uh, to look at the business interests to look, because again, at the end of the day, they know it is contributing to uh, national growth and uh, uh, national power. Thank you. I'm conscious of the time minister, but one question about the Indo-Pacific region. You've been, uh, you, you, have, you have a very distinct point of view and a vision for the Indo-Pacific region. And I think uh, from a business point of view, the region is of great importance to us. How do you think we should be approaching the Indo-Pacific region to explore its full potential and also build a great strategic partnership? You know, if there is one set of people in India to whom I should not be explaining Indo-Pacific, it's the business world. And I'll tell you why. Just ask yourself. Look at the last 20 years with the 20 years before that. Tell me today how much more Japan, Korea, China, ASEAN, Australia matter to you now? And how much, you know, how big were they in your thinking Correct. 20, 30 years ago? Okay. And you would agree with me. There's been a huge shift. I mean, uh, uh, as, a, as a sweeping proposition, people say more than half our trade today goes east of India. Okay. Now, when we began this, uh, you know, this was uh, in 1991, 92, as we were coming out of our uh, situation then, uh, we saw uh, sort of lessons in, in the Asia. Okay. So it began, if you see the reform era actually began with a kind of look east. And, you know, a lot of the ASEAN countries were very close partners. Now, in the 25 years that has passed, we've, we have developed. We have become bigger, you know, uh, uh, the Indian economy has grown, the Indian footprint has grown, Indian corporates have grown. So uh, what has happened is, uh, as we have grown, the zone of our interaction and zone of our interest has also brought it. Now, we, the, somewhere there was a sort of mental barrier. You know, there is the ASEAN, that's Indian Ocean, that's like, you know, the end of the world. After that, it's a cliff. Now, we've discovered that wasn't the case, that... The, the more we sort of went out, uh, we discovered more and more opportunities. So to me, Indo-Pacific at the end of the day is a, is a very emphatic statement that don't artificially separate the Indian Ocean uh, and India from the Pacific Ocean and those countries. The world is much more seamless. Only a person who's in denial of globalization would actually contest Indo-Pacific. And certainly an Indian who understands today our interests are beyond the Indian Ocean uh, 
we'll, we'll see the logic of it. Now, I'm giving you the economic argument. Now, a similar thing appears, uh, you know, happens in the on the security side as well. Uh, so, so to me, it's a very natural evolution. It represents evolution of India. Right. And uh, thank you very much. That again, as you said, the trade and business community from India have been looking at the Indo-Pacific region, but I think this context helps. That brings us to the end of the time that we have, Minister. I'm conscious of uh, your other comments. But before I thank you, I just wanted to share with you that as part of our efforts to adapt to the virtual and digital connect for doing business, FIKI has launched a year-long expo, which we call uh, Expo 2020, covering agriculture, manufacturing, and services sectors. The FIKI annual Expo 2020 offers an engaging and progressive platform where buyers and sellers from across the globe can connect, interact, and grow to their fullest potential in spite of the challenges thrown up by the pandemic. This has been inspired by the visit of our Honorable Prime Minister for creating Atme Bharat movement. FIKI Expo also proposed spotlight and showcase the important initiative and key, key schemes of the government. Visitors can access exhibitors around the clock across all 365 days with translation, B2B, and virtual exhibition facilities. FIKI institutional partners worldwide would channelize global participation for this one-of-a-kind largest virtual ex exhibition. With your permission, we would like to screen a one-minute video film about the Expo Minister. Please. Thank you. Uh, let me say, uh, after seeing the film, uh, I think it's a very commendable initiative uh, for a variety of reasons. One, I'm very glad you did it virtually because I think that's very much in keeping with the with the uh, sort of uh, uh, shall I say the the fashion of the year. Uh, but I I think beyond as well. Uh, the second, it's it's good you are actually showcasing Indian industry, Indian businesses. Uh, because uh, uh, I think the world needs to know more about India. Uh, it's and and uh, that is something again as a foreign minister I can tell you is is something which is uh, very much uh, in our favor. So I'm really very uh, glad you've done this uh, virtual expo. Uh, and uh, once again, let me take the opportunity uh, to wish your 93rd annual convention uh, all success and to you uh, uh, in your tenure uh, in this very important responsibility. Thank you, Minister. You're truly kind. And thank you for your words of encouragement. You've always been an inspiration and you've always embraced Fiki very, very supportively. And uh, we are proud to be a partner of Government of India, Ministry of External Affairs, and uh, support you in your endeavor to build a resilient, self-reliant, and future-ready India. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you.